Hello, welcome to Tub Talks with Damon. My special guest today is Fabio Tavares. You are a New York personality. I don't know, activist, act, acrobat, educator, teacher, so many, many, many roles of um, wisdom, guidance, and leadership that you exemplify for so many in the New York community so, and beyond. So I'm so glad to see you and I'm so glad to have you here. Thank you, thank you. It's <laughs> great to be here in the tub. It's so great to have you in the tub and to see you again in real life. Thank you. It's been a very long time. It's been a while, right? It has been a while. You look the same. So yeah, but <laughs> I'm a little more gray, oh, wow. but I like it. I'm owning it. I'm going for it. I'm going for the daddy thing because okay. I'm just so glad to still be here. Oh, yeah, exactly. So yeah, <laughs> exactly. So Fabio, the first thing I'm asking mm -hmm. the guests in my tub is what do you like most about your body? Ooh, um, well, it's interesting because, you know, I've gone through phases, yeah. you know, where there are things are really love and like obsess over and things are really hate and like try to hate speak up just a little I just oh. want to make sure everybody can hear okay you. sorry, sorry. <laughs> that's all right things I you know I really love and obsess over and then sometimes there's things I really hate and try to hate less yeah um but right now I think I'm actually pretty in love with my armpits can you can you show us how you come <laughs> sure <laughs> that's funny well, so I learned, right. I learned that they're actually Beautiful. huge. Yeah. You know, I have, a, I have an older brother uh -huh. uh, who's straight, uh -huh. who's got like super tiny armpits. Uh -huh. And we realized that like, wow, you know, my, like I have, mine is like twice as big as his. I love that. So my ex, they are beautiful. When I, thank yeah. you. When I, uh, I showed the picture to my ex, yeah. me and my brother both like posing Ooh. for the camera. My ex was like, oh, I'm glad I chose the right brother. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's always nice to hear, I think. <laughs> That's a compliment. That's a compliment. Okay. Um, what parts have you struggled with? You said there were things you didn't like before. Oh, yeah. I mean, um, just growing up, I had this thing that was like, I have, my nose is too big. Really? You know? I who mean, told you that? I, I don't know who told me that. I think my dad had a big nose. And as a child, you don't want anything big. You know, as a child, you kind of just want to fit in uh -huh. and, and like not have anything stand out. Then I thought at some point that my nose was too big and maybe I'll have a nose job. Wow. You know, this is ridiculous, right? And then until uh, I have a, a great aunt that I adore and she said to me once, you know, men are supposed to have big nose. You know, leave the small nose for women. And I said, you know what? I like that. So, you know, so I, 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 I no longer hate my nose and I actually don't think it's big at all. So, yeah. It's gorgeous. <laughs> Thank you. It's gorgeous. Thank you. So a lot of, I'm glad we're talking about the body. Mm. I think so much of your work is about the body and the mind mm. and the spirit. Mm. And you're one of those people who can encompass those areas. Like all over the years, I've seen you really work in all of those areas and really dig in. Yeah. In terms of the body, mm. I actually came to know you around my birthday about 10 years ago when a friend mm. took me to see this show down the street right. called Streb. Mm. And she said, I was like, she's like, it's this human acrobat thing. I'm like, that sounds boring. No, she's like, trust me. Mary Robinson, if you're watching this, thank you. She said, trust me, you're going to like this. Mm. So I went to see it. Incredible. And there you were doing incredible, I don't even think acrobatic is the right, act, act, what was the word that, that Elizabeth Strip used? Act, extreme action. Extreme actionists. Yes. Actionist, right? Yes, action heroes. Or action, action heroes, actionists. actionists. Yeah. So you and everybody there were like jumping and flying and diving and um, avoiding this big, 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 like metal thing from hitting your head. That's right. Tell us about Strip. Tell, tell me about your experience with that. Uh, so Strab was, uh, gosh, I think it was the most intense professional experience I've ever had. Yeah. Uh, how much did you have to train for that? Beautiful and horrible because, you know, I mean, there's so, uh, there's a lot. I was with them for 14 years. 14 years. 14 years. Yeah. Wow. And, uh, That's amazing. we, you know, we typically rehearsed, I want to say 22, 23 hours a week. Sometimes we had uh, five shows a week, so and then sometimes if it depends our home season. At some point we had like a twelve week run of like Thursday through Sunday shows, and 
and I was fortunate enough to uh, travel uh, the globe with Strab. Wow. You know, we have uh, been to uh, Europe and Asia and Canada and, and all over the U.S. Many times, many, 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 many times. And I, I tell people that Strab taught me about uh, discipline mm -hmm. and responsibility. Because uh, when I joined Strab, I was just this really sort of what's the word, wild kid who was discovering Williamsburg and, you know, uh, 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 Electro Clash and Berlinsburg and all these like weekday party, weeknight parties. Uh, I love drinking and smoking and doing drugs in the bathroom. And when I joined Streb, I realized that that was not compatible because if I wanted to be a high elite athlete and dancer that I was going to have to take care of myself, better care of myself, right? So I really owe a lot of that part of my life, self-care and growing up and getting sober to my work with Streb. So that demands of that work, that acrobatic physical demands was why you got sober. It was, I, I, I was, uh, you know, deep down in, Inside me, I had that voice saying, um, how much longer are you going to be able to push this? Because one of the reasons why I left Brazil at the age of 24, I had just turned 24 when I moved to New York, was what we call in AA a polar geographics. So I really left Brazil because the problem was Brazil. Right? So I came to New York, determined that this is a new life, a new start, a fresh beginning. And then I, I was really going to uh, try to get my shit together. And, you know, I was all by myself, you know, on that mission. And it only works for, uh, you know, for so long, you know. Uh, and I just remember I would struggle with alcohol, cigarettes, but, and, 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 but mainly my problem was cocaine at the time. So that started here or in Brazil? In Brazil. Okay. Yeah. I ran away from Brazil. I ran away from the Brazilian Coke. Mm. You know, so I moved to New York to get sober. Is Brazilian Coke different from New York <laughs> ah, Coke? Ah, I, I, well, it's a good question. I think I want to say it was purer. Uh -huh. um, but, you know. Okay. Yeah. And so you came here for that. Well, that was one of the things that brought you to New York was getting away from the scene. Correct. Correct. And then what happened? And then what happened was, you know, I discovered nightlife. You know, I was lonely. I, uh, I wanted to connect with people. I started going to bars again. And very soon I discovered, you know, back rooms and dealers and goodie bags and things that people offer you, and I never said no to drugs. Mm -hmm. That's, that was one of my things. I was never one of those people like, what is that? What's, like, wh how do you do that? How, it was no, okay, how much it costs? How many of those do you have? I'll be right back. I would run to an ATM to get cash, and I would get as many as I could get my hands on. And I was always like, holy shit, I only have like two or three baggies left. You know, I just would start worry about worrying about where do I get more? What was the appeal at that time? What were the what was the appeal of drugs and cocaine for you emotionally? I think it had this um, illusion of freedom. Mm. You know, freedom. Like fuck it, fuck you, mm. fuck the world. You know, I just I'm just gonna be gay. And I'm going to be, you know, whatever. I just want to be sexy and gay. And I want to just not worry about tomorrow or worry about anything else ever. And, but what I started to realize was that most of the people I would hang out with would go home at some point. Mm -hmm. People would start saying, yo, I got to go. Yo, I got to work tomorrow. Yo, the bar is closing. I need, you know, and I, I never understood that. Are you kidding me? I don't know. And the last place I want to go back to is home. You know, I never want the party to end. The party never ends. Why would you live in Manhattan if you were planning to go home? Right, right. exactly. Right. Wow. So you would stay up all night. Yeah. You would keep the party going. Yeah. 
And the goal at that moment was to experience freedom. Correct. Freedom from what? Good question. I think it's freedom from fear, from shame, from mm -hmm. guilt, from... What kind of guilt? Uh, well, I think it had a lot to do with the fact that I you know, grew up gay in Brazil and I was the only gay child in the family. I never really had any <clears throat> role models. So from a very early age, I understood that I was fundamentally broken. 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 Yeah. Fundamentally, that I, there, there must be something wrong with, it, with me because not only <clears throat> did I want to dance, you know, I wanted to be a ballet dancer. Yeah. Well, like my brother and my cousins and everybody else was into soccer and, and, and automobiles and motorcycles and, and like guys stuff. I wanted to dance and I wanted to study poetry and I wanted to study foreign languages. And, you know, and, and, and I, I was, when puberty hit, I was sexually attracted to men, which was like, fuck, I must be really, uh, you know, messed up because not only uh, I'm not like you, I mean, I'm like you, okay. thank, thank goodness, okay. but not only I'm, I'm not like these, every, all these men in my life, but I like this thing that it's, I'm not supposed to like. You know, that's dirty, that's wrong, that's sinful, that I'm going to go to hell for that kind of stuff. I'm going to get AIDS. I'm going to die of AIDS. So, did you, did you know people or did you see people dying of AIDS in Brazil at that time? As I, as I hit puberty at the age of 13, uh, one of our biggest Brazilian singers and songwriters, Cazuza, was on the cover of a magazine and the headline was like, I have AIDS. And he had all the chaos... And he looked so bad, and he was dying. So it was clear, if you're gay, you're dying of AIDS, right? You and I talked about yeah. this before, yeah. Yeah, it's a very common experience yeah. a lot of us had. And this was around, what, about the late 80s or 90s? This must have been early 90s, yeah. Early 90s. yeah. Okay, so that was the message. Yeah. You're broken, Yeah. you're wrong, Yeah. and if you even consider acting on this, you're going to die of AIDS. Correct, correct, yeah. So that's a lot of pressure on, a, on anyone, especially a small child. Yeah. yeah. And so once you got hold of coke and once you got hold of drugs and alcohol, there was a sense of freedom from all of that oppression. Correct. Correct. And a little bit of joy. Yeah. You know, a little bit of, you know, so guilt free pleasure. You know, like, of like saying, fuck it, I don't care. Yeah. You know? Okay, now I understand <laughs> why that release yeah. felt so necessary yes. at that time. And there was no one else or nothing else that offered that to you, that gave you a way to feel empowered and free. Correct. Without chemicals. Correct. At that time. Correct. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So you came to New York. Yeah. Streb looked like something, okay. Yeah. And you jumped, you know, literally jumped yeah. in. Yeah. Stop using. Was that hard to stop after you'd been living here for a while? And well, you... I mean, you know, the, my my bottom was really crazy because I hit bottom at my at the beginning of Strab, uh -huh. and I started showing up high, showing up late I for like rehearsals. Yeah. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but if you don't have full <laughs> um, efficacy over your body, something really dangerous could happen because you folks are like jumping and flying. Did anything like that happen to you? No, luckily no. But you know, but the thing was, I was putting not only my life in danger, but I was pulling, putting the life of everyone else in danger. Oh, and and the thing was like, I don't know what to do because I only I went out last night for a few drinks, and here I am, ten hours later, cracked out my mind, having to show up for a rehearsal and pretend everything is fine, and but luckily by that point. There was something inside me that was longing for a different kind of freedom. You know, I was, because I was one of those, you know, and I've been sober for uh, almost uh, 17 years now, and so grateful for that. But I was one of those uh, drunks and, 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 and tweakers who would like be up all night and then like go to a park or something and, you know, and see people jogging in the morning and I would feel jealous. I was like, oh, I wish that was me. 
You know, I wish that I was waking up right now sober and clean and healthy and rested and that I was going to go for a jog. Because that sort of, that's what, that was my ideal. And yet I was stuck in this other world that, yes, it, it served its purpose. But I was tired of it and, and, and stuck in it and didn't really know how to go from darkness to light, you know? So to speak. It's interesting that you say that it had a purpose, that there was an adaptability mm -hmm. for coke and drug use at that time in your life. Correct. But it had long outlived its purpose by that point, by the time you were in Streb, by the Correct. time you were seeking to change your life. Correct. But it actually did have a function. Thank you. Yes. It was my so I, I needed that. Yeah. It was so important. I feel it was really important because it, it in a way, and I hear this a lot in the rooms, like that it it, it it saves me. It saved me, mm -hmm. you know, for a while. It sort of, it was a solution. Right. It was a solution at that time. And it was the only solution that you were being offered at exactly, the time. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. But then it got to that point where it was not functional. It was not adaptable anymore. Correct. It was hurting you more than it was helping. It wasn't helping you anymore. It was just hurting you. Correct. Okay. Correct. Yeah. And then, so did you start immediately going to, to meetings or how did you, how did you break the cycle? Well, so after, you know, sort of, pulling in a couple of no-shows and lying and people calling the police and searching in hospitals and... Because you were... Because they thought you were missing? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I actually was missing for, you know, for a little... I just... There was this one day that I... I was so high on crystal math and I decided I wasn't going to sh call anybody and I was just turning off my, like, flip, flip phone. Mm -hmm. And I said, fuck it. And so that day I was gone for three days and people were really concerned about me. And at that point, when I came home, I said, okay, fuck. I was like, now we just, uh, I ran out of excuses. I have to come clean and tell people. So I told everybody at Strab that I had a problem. I said, you know, I think I have a problem. And I think I can't really drink safely because it all started with alcohol with me. You know, it all started with a couple of drinks and, and, uh, and yeah. So, uh, and I did not want to give up drinking. I was like, I tried so hard. And so then Strep put me on probation. You know, Elizabeth grabbed me very kindly and lovingly. And she says, I love you, but I'm trying to run a business here. Yeah. And, and so they put me on probation right as we were about to leave for a tour in the uh, Pacific Midwest, uh, Portland. Mm -hmm. um, I remember where we went to Portland. Went to Napa, then we went to uh, a couple of other places, and and I and I had to go to meetings while I was on tour. That was part of the probation. That was part of the probation agreement. Yeah. And, but I had to have a sober buddy with me always. Uh -huh. Can you imagine? Like I disappear on tour, and like you know, I'm just like... anyway, I'm so grateful that they actually um, gave me that chance. And say, you know, like, do your part, we'll do our part. And, and you know, and that's how I started going to meetings. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, are you comfortable? Do you I am to, very comfortable. Okay. Yeah, thank you. So, are you? Yeah. Okay, okay, good. So, I hear you saying that there was a part of you that still wanted to be able to drink alcohol socially and enjoy that. But you came to understand that was not on the menu. If you were going to drink alcohol, it inevitably led to these other adverse events. Correct. And I know that a lot of people struggle mm -hmm. with that, that, you know, they, they want to find a balance and some people can, some people just don't because some people can't. Correct. Yeah. But that was a part of your probation with Elizabeth Streb and you made that, you still had to prioritize the work yeah. Yeah. over the drugs. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And if I was late or if I was whatever, they would fire me on spot mm. and they would revoke my my sponsorship they had just became my sponsors mm. so it's like i had my dream job i had finally a spot because your immigration sponsors yeah at my, oh. my, for my visa status because the, the company the company to, yes. to give you work status correct okay so correct. that was another reason not to fuck it up yes okay yeah wow so suddenly i'm like living this dream i'm finally being a professional performer in new york fucking city yeah and not only that but i'm i'm sort of thriving in what I'm doing and I'm really enjoying the work and yet I'm not able to sort of stay sober and show up for that 
You know, so it really told it, it was really telling for me. It was like, okay, Fabio, bitch, you have a problem. And and then this is what's crazy. I realized at the same time that I come from a family where there's a lot of drug addiction. A lot of drug addiction, um, like a lot of unmanageability with alcohol and drug addiction, sex addiction, gambling, food addiction. I mean, and once I started reflecting about my situation and I started thinking of my cousin, my other cousin, my aunt, my uncle, my father, my, I was like, fuck, you know, it sort of, it, it occurred to me that it was like, I, it, was, it was either now or there wouldn't be a, a later opportunity. For me. Wow. And yeah. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I'm moved. I'm so moved hearing this. Thank you. So then with Stred, that continued 14 years. Yes. And then you stepped away from that. Yes. How come? So I became the Associate Artistic Director, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and I stayed in that position for 10 years. And then I think what happened was I got really good at it. And and I loved the work, and the work was, it, it, you know, I, Elizabeth and I have always had a great relationship. And it just got to a point where I thought, okay, Fab Fabio, you're sort of approaching your 40s. I think I must have been 40-something. And I thought, I need, I need to make more money. You know, I need to uh, start a career. I need to focus on what I'm going to do once I leave Strap. Mm -hmm. Folks usually stay in Strap. I mean, some people would stay 10 years or, or plus, but a lot of people stay in Strap for a few years. And they move on. And I had stayed for all that time, and it just felt like maybe it was time for me to focus on my own work, whatever that means, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, I didn't really want to be uh, Elizabeth's successor, mm -hmm. you know, which I think it's what allowed me to stay in the job for so long. Because, you know, like I didn't want to be her, I didn't want to, like I wanted to help her. Yeah. You know, you were competing with her. No, yeah, exactly. Just, yeah, I wanted to help yeah. her. I wanted to say, how can I help you yeah. achieve or accomplish this thing? Yeah. So, but at some point, I realized I need more money to live. I need more. You know, I need, you know, health insurance, and I need. I mean, we had health insurance for a while, off and on, and I just needed to focus on like grow, grown up Fabio. Mm -hmm. You know. Mm -hmm. So, Fabio in his 40s needs to. Fabio in his 40s, yeah. 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 So you then proceeded to open your own business? Correct. So I went into my uh, an Alexander Technique training, okay. a, a training program in yeah. 2010. Can you explain what Alexander Technique is? Yes. Oh my God, it's one of the hardest things ever to explain. And we have like forums and, and workshops uh -huh. amongst Alexander teachers to try to explain what this thing is. Um, one of the things that the Alexander Technique does, it improves your postural tone. Mm -hmm. So it makes you breathe better and therefore it makes you move better. As we're both like sitting up now. <laughs> it's like, okay, I'm gonna put my posture. I'm breathing. Okay. So it's one of the things, but it's, it, it goes beyond that because it's really uh, a mental system, very simple system that looks at how much mental tension do I have right now? in this given act that I'm performing. And even like sitting right now, this is a physical act. Mm -hmm. You know, well, we, we probably don't think of sitting or reading a book as a physical thing, but it is highly physical because here we are, you know, standing against gravity, sitting against gravity with our legs that are probably doing something that we either are aware of it or not, with our arms doing something that we're either aware of it or not, and so, with the Alexander Technique, we start looking at these relationships between the things we're thinking and the things we're doing. Mm. And they actually ultimately become the same thing. Because thought and body, it's one thing. It's, the, you know, thought and muscle, it's the same thing. It all comes from the same place. It all, it all lives in the body. And, and so, and I... I went into the Alexander Technique world in my early 20s because I was a dancer and an actor. But suddenly I just had this like, wow, it was almost like a drug in a way. <laughs> Such an addict. And it was almost like a drug that I realized, fuck, this feels amazing. And I, I 
can't really believe that I get, I, there are things inside myself mm -hmm. that I can access and I can have some control over. Um, and it make me feel, those things have the power to make me feel better, to make me feel lighter, freer, to make me feel more energized, more ready to adapt to change, mm -hmm. you know, because life is about movement, right? Sitting is about movement, standing is about movement, and how ready are we to react to life? And if the body is free and supple, then you react to life with more poison grace. Mm -hmm. And rather, if people, you know, if we're collapsed and stiff, and it's hard to like, it's so that was Alexander's thing. It was like, it's hard to make decisions if the body is not, follow, you know, if the body and the mind are not connected. So, in the Alexander framework, does physical pain or posture stem from thoughts? Or do our thoughts, are they a result of? bad posture or not holding energy in our body? Good call. They could. Or did they just check it away? Does it not make it it's, matter? They could. Okay. You know, sometimes, you know, you look at somebody's use. Uh -huh. We call this out of same posture. We call it use. Uh -huh. And you say, oh, that person's so compressed. Uh -huh. You know, that person's so compressed. That person's pelvis is pushed so far forward. Their knees are locked back. The head is pulled back. The neck is pushed forward. And then they come to you and they say, you know, I have terrible back pain. You know, I'm in so much pain, my jaw hurts and my neck hurts. And then you say, well, okay, I can see the, rel the correlation. And then when you help them move up in our language, when you help them decompress themselves a little, they feel better. Mm -hmm. And then you say, okay, so that's an use thing. That's sort of a postural thing that we can help them get out of. Sometimes people come in all compressed and they, they don't feel pain. And sometimes people come in like looking great and they're in a lot of pain. Mm. So we used to think, oh my God, if that person's compressed, they will have pain. Well, I think that that's changed a little. But we can change the mind through the body, yes. Yeah. So if you're all anxious and angry, and I say, okay, so think of your shoulders softening, think of your back widening, mm. and think of this and think of that, and I come and put my hands on you, mm -hmm. suddenly what you experience is, a sense of ease yes. and um, and even like inner peace. I'm feeling that right now. <laughs> You're so kind. <laughs> so yeah, it's true. So we can change. You it's know, totally true. And you have body. that energy, which I don't know if everyone who practices does, but you have. You, I think, because you hold that energy, you're able to transmit. Thank you. That energy in your Thank in your you. approach. I really, touch. I really enjoy doing that. Yeah. Okay, so you opened your practice, yes. and you and I were in the same building, we were under the same roof on opposite sides of the it's same true. building for several yeah. years, it's the true. St. James building, yes. we had a practice going on, yes. and then COVID. That's, that's right. Well, a little before that, I decided, I left my place in Williamsburg. It was a, a drama, you know, like the building was sold and I held out and I got a little chunk of money and I said, okay, I had left Strav, leaving Williamsburg after 17 years. Whoa, I didn't realize you were here that long. Where do I go? Wow. So my parents said, come to Brazil, uh -huh. stay here with us and then we'll, because, you know, because I had, I had no place to live. So, you know, I crashed, you know, I stayed at a a friend's place in West Village for a while. And then so I went to Brazil for five months. And I was like, okay, now I don't have the constraints of working for somebody else. I can spend time in Brazil. I realized that there was a big demand for Alexander Technique in Brazil. Oh. So, and I was like, and I just love spending time in Brazil. Yeah. And so I started going down there more often and trying to figure out, do I want to try to work this thing out between New York and Brazil. Do I want to start a practice there and a practice here? What do I want to do? You know, so that was sort of the beginning of this new phase mm. that I've been on for the last, I think, four or five years. So that was all before COVID? That was all before okay. COVID, yes. Now, during that time in Brazil, you were also either volunteering or just kind of on your own Yes. Helping people learn about PrEP, pre-exposure prophylaxis PrEP. 
Tell me about that. Very little, very little. Well, you were fighting with people on the apps. Uh, but well, also in Brazil. Yeah, in Brazil. You were helping people. Yeah, yeah. Well, How because, did that come about? Well, because, you know, I, I think uh, I joined your group and I was a little hesitant at first to be you know, get on prep. Mm -hmm. oh, why do I need that? Do I not need that? Oh my God, I'm gonna be a slut. Were you worried it would become like an addiction, like sex? No, like I just I was addiction. worried that I was it was just gonna give me permission to like have too much pleasure. Oh, right. Exactly. Mm. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> how how dare you have pleasure? Yeah. Right. How dare you have right. fun? I thought you have sober, empowered, spiritual, sexual pleasure. Exactly. Okay. But that was the whole yeah. new chapter in my life. Yeah. Thanks to you. Well, thank you. <laughs> I, I'm glad I could be any part of that. That is so amazing. But, so you learned about PrEP. I learned about PrEP. I started educating myself yeah. about PrEP and about like, why is it that I feel guilty if I have condomless sex with another person? Why is it that it, that has to be bad? And you know, when you asked that question, what was the answer? You came the up with? answer was like, well, that's called promiscuity and you're spreading diseases and you're catching diseases, mm. you know? And yes, you must, uh, if you must have condomless sex, which I used to call unprotected sex mm. back then, uh, then it has to be with a partner mm. only. <laughs> and then you have to make sure that your partner is, you know, not cheating on you and you're not cheating on your partner. And it's just this whole paranoia around this topic of pleasure and and that so the the prep facts group completely completely 100 percent 360 degree around it changed my life yeah oh because i started saying you know yeah fuck that shit yeah yeah so this was a group that i started and what i loved is that so many people from around the world yeah. were coming to the same, asking those same questions and starting to come to the same ideas that you were. And it amazed me, it didn't surprise me, but it amazed me that so many people all over the world were asking those questions and saying, why do I feel like it's not okay right. for me to celebrate sexuality without condoms and connection right. in whatever way I want to do it with whomever, however many partners I want to have up my butt without condoms that we can have that because of prep. Yeah. And just then that led to all those other questions like the religious or the society or the culture that said, no, 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 you shouldn't be yeah. enjoying sex. Yeah, bad, 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 bad. Yeah. yeah. And so once I sort of started to understand that by reading more and becoming informed, and I thought, yeah, uh, I want to get on prep and I want to have fun too and fuck this shit, you know, like I've suffered for too long, you know, yeah. my whole life I thought I was going to die of HIV. Yeah. Can you need to stretch? I'm just going to change Yeah, it. change it. There we go. Is that okay? Of course. Okay. okay. Well, like good. Make us comfortable. <laughs> okay. So I started going to Brazil more often at that time and I started seeing the HIV rates in Brazil amongst uh, kids between 15 and 21, like they were skyrocketing. 15 to 21. Yeah, kids were getting infected so like, but just like, it was like, I don't know, I just, uh, you know, something like 40 or 50% higher by the year because that was their solution. They figured out they could live with, with you know, with the, uh, with, being HIV positive, that they would become undetectable after they got on treatment, and they could have condom with sex. But people didn't really know about PrEP. Right. And I was like, wait, 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 wait. Like, there's something even better than that, that system. So you were encountering kids, 15 to 21, who weren't really that worried, not the way you and I were. We Correct. Weren't, they weren't terrified of HIV. Correct. It was a very treat. It is, and by that point, it was a very treatable Correct. condition. And it sounds like you're saying they just kind of wanted to get it over with, or yes. they just they they said we're gonna. It's yeah. almost inevitable for them. Yeah, yeah. See, now that yeah. says a lot because that's sort of my challenge often of a lot of the messaging out there, which tells people that it's at some point in your life there's one in two chance you're going to get HIV. Mm. And what that message seems to send towards is like, okay, if I'm going to get it, I might as well take ownership of that and take agency over that 
and get it over with and get it done. Yeah. Except that they, then they don't disclose their poverty yeah. because there's a stigma. Right. So suddenly I was seeing a lot of kids having condomless sex in Brazil without being on PrEP. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking, if you're having a lot of butt sex, right, mm -hmm. and you're not on PrEP, and you're not using condoms, what's the alternative? You know, what's, what's your scenario? Do you, how do you, how do you, you know? And so that, then I started to say, okay, have you ever heard of this thing called PrEP? I'm on PrEP. Right. right. Hey, do you know what? There's a thing called PrEP. You know, I've been on it for a couple of years now. And it's amazing, and you don't have to worry. About so people started like some people would dismiss me. Some people would say, "Oh, what is it called again? Never heard about it." Some people would write it down. Some people, uh, and then occasionally I would uh, bump into somebody who knew what prep was, and then they told me they said that I had to lie that I was a sex worker, so they put me on prep. This was the early days of prep in Brazil. Say that, okay, wait, in Brazil, yes. if you wanted to be on PrEP, you had to say you were a sex worker? Correct. And then they would give you PrEP. Correct. But if you just said, I'm not a sex worker, I'm just a person who wants to enjoy sex, use they would condoms, say yeah. no. Use condoms, <gasps> yeah. Why, why, you know, you shouldn't, you know, we shouldn't not use a condom. But... Do you think that's still the medical position today? I think that that luckily has changed a lot, uh -huh. thanks to people like you who are activists and who are like saying, wait, wait a minute, let's question that behavior. Um, but still, I just, you know, I think that doctors think that, you know, condoms are there and you should use condoms and, you know, and why, and then, we, and, and, and it just, it makes it harder for people to tell their doctors. Right. It becomes a cycle. Because, yeah. You can't really tell your doctor if they're going to shame you or should you yeah. about not using Correct. condoms. Yeah. So you don't talk to your doctor and then Correct. HIV. So you're saying now PrEP is more available in Brazil. A There's lot more people more. using yes. it. Have you, I know it's like really hard to get data these days, but do you think HIV, is there anything to show that HIV rates have come down or that PrEP has had any impact? I am sure there is. I haven't been really up to date to that stuff, but I know that there's a lot of people on PrEP in Brazil now. So that was partly, it sounds like, because you were there, living there, having these conversations with people. Possibly. I think I want to believe that, I want to fantasize that I had a very small impact. It takes a village. And to, exactly. Because yeah. I was really open. And then occasionally I would uh, chat with people online and they said, oh, I'm on prep too. And I would say, but why don't you tell people, why don't, you, why don't, I, why don't I see it on your profile? Mm. Oh, no, I don't like to tell people I'm on prep. You know, they didn't want to say it on a profile because there was still the... Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Good old days of... Yeah, good, good old days of... Uh, it's, it's funny, I thought of you because yesterday I'm on Scruff and I get this message from a 52-year-old man saying, um, Hey, sexy, I just want to say uh, use condoms. Life is worth living. <laughs> yes. Boy. So I was like, my reaction was like, I had like so many different reactions. And then I said to him, what, what decade are you living in again? You know, but I think it's, you know, like oh, life is worth living. Use condoms. Oh boy. <laughs> like, well, life is worth living. That's why I take that. Exactly. You know? Exactly. Um, Wow. So that, those ideas are still out there. Now, did this person come at you in an angry way, an aggressive way? No, or just he, sort of that moralistic should? Yeah, out? he was just kind of saying, oh, I, you know, I'm just, I'm just old-fashioned, you know, or like old-school pre-prep. And I say, I just didn't even respond. Yeah, old-school was that people fucked all the time about condoms. Exactly. Because that's how it was done up in, like, for centuries and billions of years until 1981. Exactly. I mean, you know, until AIDS hit and then condoms started to be suggested for, for sex. Correct. Though we had very little evidence, they worked, but they were a practical solution. What's so interesting to me is that condoms up until very recently had no real evidence. Mm. They made sense, but they were never FDA approved, but doctors recommended them all the time. So when a drug came around that was greater than 99%, that was FDA approved and CDC endorsed, there was still this resistance. Isn't that funny? Yeah. It's like yeah. that. So that's why we say that's that's an example of morality over medicine, mm. of, of dogma over data. Because mm. yeah. they're not looking at the data. Yeah. They're just looking at like their their morality. Yeah. Their yeah. ethics.
Yeah. Wow. Okay. Now, recently, if I may ask, uh -huh. I know that you have been through a significant loss yes. in your life. May I ask you about that? Sure. sure. Okay. Yeah. So we were discussing that recently you lost your father. Yeah. And I just wanted to check in about how you're doing and what that was like. Thank you. Yeah, I think that was the hardest thing that I've ever, 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 ever had to go through. Um, he passed away one one day after my birthday last year, June twenty second. Um, it was completely unexpected, and I. I think that my family, my mom especially, and I are just going through like this huge traumatic event. He was young, he was healthy. Um, How did he pass? Well, it's unclear. Uh, they had COVID. Mom, dad, my sister, nephews, and her husband, my brother-in-law, all had COVID. Both my parents were fully vaccinated at the time and they had mild symptoms you know except that everybody recovered and he didn't his health kind of just started to decline and and my mom thought maybe he's depressed maybe there's a syndrome or post covid syndrome or something he just didn't seem to be able to bounce it off. And, and, I, and then my mom was like, you know, for two days he couldn't sleep and the doctors were coming over to listen to his lungs and the lungs were fine and listen to the heart, the heart was fine and taking all the exams and tests and there was an oxygen cylinder at home and case. It was like, we thought it was some sort of crazy psychological thing that was going on. And so I got on a plane, it was this last summer, and I said, I'm going to Brazil because I'm fully vaccinated and I'll just go help my mom until dad gets better. And I got there and when I saw him, he was, he was dying, sitting on the couch. And they were waiting, this was a Saturday, the, the, the pul pulmonary, pulmonologist or the lung specialist was gonna come over on Monday and that Saturday night, he was rushed into the hospital, got into the ICU, got on a ventilator, and never left um, for nine days. So it's like, we don't really know. We don't really know. You know, was it COVID? Well, that was like 14 days after he had been infected. Was it a late COVID complication? Um, he's, uh, he didn't have a fever. He, so technically he was fine. The heart was strong, the lungs were fine. Everything was like, we don't really know what happened. Apparently he developed a, a blood clot overnight or something, like a, some sort of a, something on his leg or, and, but we don't know. I mean, just, he was so young and, and the whole thing just a, a freak accident. And that we're still sort of trying to figure out what happened so thanks for asking did you have any conversations with him in those last days i did in the last well we facetimed on wednesday and when i saw he could barely speak that's when thursday i thought i'm leaving for brazil and friday i i, I got I got on the plane so i saw him on saturday and then saturday i was with him for six hours before he was gone i actually i was on the ambulance with him um, but we were texting, you know, he was just very gentle and kind. We had a great relationship, uh, which is really surprising, you know, as a gay, as a gay boy. Uh, and, and my father was very kind and tender with me for the last 10, 15 years, especially. We got really closer to each other, you know. He was a great guy, very generous. Um, very good, a good, a good hearted person, you know, always, he would always put others ahead of himself, you know, yeah. How are you taking care of yourself? That's very, I mean, that sounds really traumatizing. Yeah. Well, you know, luckily I'm in therapy. I have an amazing therapist that I love. 
Had you been in therapy before this? Or? Yes. Okay. Yes. So you already had that established relationship. Yes. And then the last couple of years, I started doing something called somatic experiencing, mm -hmm. which is like a somatic therapy mm -hmm. um, that I was very reluctant <laughs> to get into at first. Because I was like, oh, I know everything about the body already. What could you possibly, what new thing could you possibly show me? You know? And I'm actually so, so grateful that I get to uh, just pay attention to my body in a different way. That's not necessarily just through the thinking, as Alexander is a lot through th thinking, mm -hmm. but it's more through like sensations and perceptions and feelings and, and images. That, like, that there's, because it's thera therapeutic, there are no really rules. Everything is allowed in that setting. And I have an amazing therapist. So that's been really helpful too, because that's just dealing with trauma that stays lodged in the body. Yeah. Body keeps the score. Yes. You know, so yes. that's been great. And I've just, I have a great sponsor in AA and CMA, and I uh, go to meetings and I have sponsors. Like, I'm involved. I do a lot of work. So you're still, the meetings are helping. Yeah. And you're also in a, a mentor, a sponsorship role. Yeah. That helps. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the, the work I do, the teaching job I do, which is constantly, Reminding me of where's where is my support? Where's my breath? What are you teaching now? Yeah, where? Yeah, what is that? Do you want so, to talk about? Yeah, so I am uh, teaching at Yale, yes. at David Geffen School of Drama at Yale. Yes, I teach two classes there. Uh, I just started this semester. I'm so so grateful, and so it's been so amazing. And then I have a private practice here in New York City. I see folks in Midtown. I have an office in Midtown. For Alexander. Alexander. Yes. Okay, so you're back. No, you're yeah. Back yes, yeah. Yay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. And they do zero balancing, which is treatment. It's sort of like an Alexander technique table lesson on steroids. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm sort of slowly building a clientele back and commuting to New Haven once a week. Um, and sort of trying to figure out, you know, what's next. I'm, I'm in a play. I'm an actor as well. And uh, I'm in a play that opens in the fall. Where? What play? At the Tank. Uh, it's called Immense Joy uh -huh. with Anna Kohler from the Worcester Group veteran and okay. teaches at MIT. Uh, really interesting experimental uh, play. Where is this going to be? So the tank is in Midtown. Okay. It's like on the 32nd. Um, okay. it's, it's, yeah. Oh, I'm so there. Oh, yes. Please come. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I'll be sure to uh, let everyone know. Wow. Okay. So acting, teaching mentoring, helping in private practice. There's a lot, There's a lot so much there. energy. Yeah. How do you ever, are these things that replenish your energy or do you ever have those days where you're like, I cannot get up off the couch. I cannot move. Well, <laughs> as a matter of fact, today has you know, been one of those days of like, oh fuck, you know, like uh, this too much. Too many things. I actually canceled my two o'clock class. Remember I told you how to class? Yeah. I canceled it because I was like, I was like, I can't, I just don't want to do it today. You know, and two people had uh, told me they weren't going to come. And I was like, okay, yeah. And I had this thing I needed to return. And I bought this, these things and they were small. And I was like, fuck, you know, what do I do? So I just I had things I needed to get done. And I just didn't really want, I just, I was like, okay, I need to, I need to slow down, and couldn't answer people's call, your friends calling, people reaching out, text. I just, it just felt a little much. Yeah, a lot of energy being asked of you. Yes. Okay. Yeah. How does sitting in the tub feel? It feels great. Okay. Yes. It feels so great. This is one of the things I've learned to do. I've been in this place for fourteen years, but I never took it. I never used this tub until I started doing these interviews. I'm like, this is a really nice way this is a, to replenish my energy. This is a great tub. Yeah. It's a great tub in having these conversations. Yeah. How? So it sounds like this is still a process of learning balance, mm. of learning self-care, mm. of really tapping into that freedom and strength that you described earlier. Yeah. yeah. How old are you now? 46. Okay. So this is wonderful. So that's a... You know, we are all, I think, in this process. And even for those of us who thought we had this figured out, COVID 
messed all that up. Like, what does self care that looks like? What does balance look like? Yeah. It's something I'm still learning. And it's kind of neat for me to hear that, you know, that other people, not that you're struggling, but you know, like that oh, you're, yeah. you're, you're someone who appears to me to always have your shit together. Oh, thank you. And yeah. it's like, it's... you know, I know that that's an assumption. If I'm saying that about you, it's an assumption I'm making, but yeah. you know, sometimes it's like, all right, we are in the, cause people say that to me sometimes too, like, oh, they just assume yeah, like, you I'm struggling. I'm, I'm struggling. Oh, fuck. <laughs> you know, look, I say that. My clients know it's like there's some days it's like I can do a lot of stuff and there's some days all I can do is sit on that couch in the living room and watch Golden Girls reruns and that that's that's my capacity right for for energy that day right. so I've tried especially with COVID I've learned not to judge it not mm -hmm. to have an opinion about it say okay on the days that I have a lot of energy I'm going to go with it but on the days I don't have a lot of energy I'm not going to judge myself I'm not right. going to put myself down or should myself for right that. right right I'm right. just going to be lazy fuck. And if I don't leave this house, then I don't leave this house because right. that's all part of the process. Right, right. I right. like that. And yeah. I, I try to be that gentle sometimes too. And today was one of those days I'd never canceled this class before mm. since we, you know, the beginning of the pandemic. And today I said, you know what? I, don't, I feel cranky. Mm -hmm. uh, I got I got like three more things to take care of before I leave the house because I knew I was going to come here see you. I said, I'm going to cancel that class. So I emailed a couple of people. And, you know, that was it. That was the end of the story. You know, suddenly I have extra time. And then I also sometimes, like, I'm choosing not to engage. You know, like, uh, it's, it's, and this is, a, like, for you as a therapist, I'm always interested in hearing what other people, how other people think about this. It's like, you know, oftentimes I think very close to, I get very close to pushing that, like, nuclear bomb, nuclear button. And say, fuck it, fuck you, I'm gonna say it now, and then I don't. So, you know, Fabio, take a step back. Mm -hmm. Take a little bit of time, because because then oftentimes I feel like when I am angry and and get engaged in a fight or something, I feel horrible after. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was like, well, and then, but I also feel like too many times. I'm like not pushing that button. And I wonder, like, I think it's healthy and important sometimes to say, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and push that fucking nuclear button right now mm -hmm. and say, fuck it. What do you think about that? You mean uh, against another person? Yeah. So, or in a, situ or in a public situation or, you yeah. know, or, I think there can be benefits and drawbacks to both. What I do is try to make sure I'm clear why I'm doing what I'm doing. You're Let me think that. about what I'm thinking about. I was just at a conference this past week. I was going to say, there's a certain leader in the community who is not acting right. Uh -huh. And he tried to deflect that. He tried to distract that. And I absolutely called him out privately, not uh -huh. publicly, but uh -huh. absolutely consciously, clearly told him why I don't think his behavior is acceptable. And I don't think he heard a word I said, mm -hmm. but I was like, I'm not generally one to confront people, but if I do, mm -hmm. it's going to be done in a way that's clear and it's going to be done in a way that's loving. Mm -hmm. And if I can't, if I don't know mm -hmm. why I'm doing it, I won't do it. Okay, good. Thank if you. I'm not sure where I'm at, I'm just, my, 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 my thing would be to say no. But in this case, I was like, I don't want to enable this toxic behavior that this leader is engaging in. And perhaps he's going to ignore me. I think he did ignore me, but I know he ran away from me mm -hmm. for the rest of the conference of every time we were in the same area. Of course. But um, that to me is like, because I want him to do better. Mm. I want him to do better. And when he's a better leader, his community is better. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. yes, it was strict, but yes, I had a reason for speaking my mind. Mm -hmm. What I try not to do, and I'm not perfect at this folks, but what I try not to do is react. Mm. Like in the moment, yeah. Yeah. you know, to go off on someone in the moment right. without any reflection, without any knowing why. I see. Yeah. 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 And Does that make sense? Uh, totally. Yeah. You know, but I think there's a time to hold your tongue. There's a time to speak your mind. And there, there's often a balance. Like sometimes for me, writing it down first, mm. maybe in an email mm. or at least just writing it down. So if I speak to this person, mm -hmm. at least I'm going to have the clarity. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes, it's a great practice. Thank you. Yes, you know. So this is what I'm learning. This is what we're learning. Yeah. And I want to say thank you. Despite the day today, you kept your agreement to show up. Of course. And you know, I'm saying showing up is a really, really big part of celebrating life, of being involved in life, mm -hmm. of creating community. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's times that we may not be able to, or or may choose to prioritize our our health. 
Correct. But I do think as I encourage people as much as able to show up and, you know, be where you say you're going to be. And I really want to thank you for being here today, despite a lot of other stuff. Thank you. This means a lot to me. Thanks for inviting me. I was actually oh so, God. I felt so uh, important, you know. Oh, you're on my list. When you asked me and I, and I yeah, I'm so glad I was able to do this today. Thank but, you. Yeah. It, one last question. If you could go back and give that little boy in Brazil a piece of advice, that little boy who started to think that he's wrong or different, and you could say something to him today, what would that be? Just, just don't worry too much. Everything is going to be fine. You know, just, just, yeah, don't worry too much. You know, everything's going to be fine. Good advice. Don't worry, it's going to be fine. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take that advice, and thank you so much for joining me in the tub. If thank people you. want to work with you or learn more about your practice or just see more of what you're up to, how would you like people to, to follow you? Um, well, I'm on Instagram, Fabio, A-T-N-Y-C. A-T is my last name, Augusto Tavares, but it's also Alexander Technique. Fabio, A-T-N-Y-C on Instagram, and my website is healthandpoise.com. So those are the links. If you're watching this on YouTube, those links will be right underneath. And if you're watching this on YouTube and you like this interview, please subscribe. Even if you don't like the interview, subscribe anyway. Um, <laughs> because when I, it actually helps the, 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 it helps with the YouTube metrics. Absolutely. And, and yeah. I'm learning all yeah. about that stuff right now. All right, everybody. Thank you for watching. Have a wonderful day. Take good care of yourself. See you next time on Tough Talks. Bye. Thank Bye. you.